But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Years I spent in vanity and in pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurn. Till my guilty soul in pouring turned. was free there your pardon multiplied to me there my burden so found liberty at Calvary now I've given Jesus everything now I gladly know him as my
justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given to us. 
You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, we thank you for the cross. We are not saved by what we have done right and uh, what you have done, your work you have done on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for the cross because the cross says that you're not done with us, that you want to do something in us that we never thought possible in a way we could never imagine. The cross gives us hope. 
you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you, God, for just sacrificing your son on our behalf. We love you and we worship you, our God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good evening, Redeemer, and uh, happy Good Friday. Uh, you don't need me to tell you that these days are very, very different for all of us. And uh, I hope that um, the video that you watch tonight will be a blessing to you and to your family. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit special. Uh, tonight, you're not going to hear only from me, but all of our elders have put together a short sermon, a short message, a short reflection on the cross for you. And so... Uh, Hope that you'll have your Bible ready and maybe be able to turn quickly with each of the elders as they draw our attention to the scriptures and more importantly to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hello, Redeemer family. I'm not used to talking to a camera, so I'm a little bit nervous. So I hope that you'll give me and my fellow elders a little bit of grace as we share some of our thoughts about Good Friday. As I ponder what Good Friday means, I am drawn to one of Jesus' names, the Lamb of God. The name is full of imagery from both the Old Testament and from Revelation. While we don't have a modern analogy, the Jews living in Jesus' time were very familiar with the sacrificial lamb as it encompassed a large part of their daily worship at the temple. God had instructed the priest to sacrifice a lamb twice a day, an unblemished lamb, once in the morning and once in the evening. God had also instructed the priest to perform a sacrifice of a lamb on, for a sin offering and for a guilt offering. But Psalm 51 teaches us that God did not delight in these burnt offerings. He was more interested in the heart attitude that was behind the offering. He wanted to make sure that they were right and that they understood that his purposes were. However, he instituted this practice of, a, of offering as a picture of his plan for salvation that he first mentioned in Genesis 3 and that he promised to Abraham in Genesis 12. God was foreshadowing that the payment for sin Jesus would make on the cross. Another picture emerges <clears throat> due to the timing of Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus, the Jews were about to celebrate Passover, a festival instituted by God to remind the Israelites about his deliverance from Egypt. While enslaved in Egypt, God had instructed the Israelites through Moses to kill an unblemished lamb and to sprinkle the blood on the doorposts and on the lintel over the door. Then, every home with blood was passed over when God executed his judgment. God instructed the Israelites to celebrate this Passover every year. And part of that Passover celebration was a sacrifice of a lamb. God knows that as humans we tend to forget things and that we needed to be reminded at times of his goodness and of his provision, of his mercy, of his deliverance. But in the Passover, God foreshadowed his plan of salvation as Jesus became the ultimate Passover lamb. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 5-7, for, for Christ, our Passover was sacrificed. Both the Old Testament sacrifices and the, pa <clears throat> and the Passover celebration point to Jesus as pictures of what, was, of what was to come, pictures that Jesus fulfilled. Jesus willingly took the punishment for, uh, for the sin that we deserve. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is the great exchange. There is no better deal. Jesus became sin. Ponder that for just a moment. Let that sink in a little bit. Jesus suffered through both physical pain and spiritual separation from the Father on the cross. The fellowship of the triune God was broken. Jesus took our punishment, our death penalty, and gave us his righteousness. Jesus is the Passover lamb who was slain to take away our sin. Good Friday begins in darkness, begins in sadness, as the Lord of glory is deserted. 
humiliated, beaten, and murdered. But thankfully, God's plan of salvation doesn't end at the cross. Revelation chapter 5 gives a view of the future in heaven. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw the, between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals. For thou wast slain and did purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Jesus is the Lamb who was slain. It was God's plan of salvation designed before the creation of the world. Through his death on the cross, Jesus purchased men from every tribe, people, nation, and tongue. And he is accomplishing his purposes, reconciling sinners to himself. Sinners like you and me. According to Romans 5, we were his enemies, but he died to redeem us. What amazing grace. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. If you are a Christian who has put your faith and trust in Jesus alone for salvation, you have peace with God as a relationship has been restored. It has been reconciled. It has been redeemed. Having peace with God allows us to experience his peace at all times, even when the times are upside down as they are today. He is our refuge, our strength, our hope, our ever-present help in times of trouble. His peace surpasses any counterfeit peace the world offers. Therefore, I encourage you to draw near to God and hold him closely. He will sustain you and be with you. The cross of Good Friday reminds us that Jesus is the Lamb of God who purchased us with his blood to be his ambassadors to the world and treating everyone to be reconciled to God. May you have a very enjoyable Easter celebration at home. It is good to be with each of you this Good Friday, albeit in a different way than what we would normally be together. But it's good to be with you nonetheless. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 26, and we'll begin at verse 36. Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. In the context of these verses, Jesus had just celebrated the Passover with his disciples and he instituted the Lord's Supper. The book of John goes on to record at this point the upper room discourse as well as the high priestly prayer that he prayed for both his disciples as well as for us. And now we see him retreating to a quiet place to be with his father, to pray and to commune. We won't focus this evening on his disciples falling asleep and not being able to stay awake for him, but instead we'll focus on Jesus 
God the Son and the conversation that he has with God the Father. As we see in verse 38, on this evening, Jesus was greatly troubled and sorrowful. Uh, in his deity, he knew what was going to happen. But in his humanity, he deeply desired not to have to go through with it. In verse 39, Jesus asked God the Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Then again in verse 42, and a third time in verse 44, he asked his Father if it might not pass from him. We see clearly through Christ's three fervent prayers. He did not want to go through with what was coming. He didn't want to experience the guilt and punishment for all of our sin and depravity. Perhaps more importantly, having been with the Father for all eternity, he didn't want a separation from the Father, which his human death for our sin would bring. In any event, his pain and sorrow were so severe at this point as he was praying, John records that he sweat drops of blood. And Luke records that angel, an angel came and minister him and strengthen him. But notice, not only did Jesus pray that the cup be taken from him, but he prayed in verse 39, verse 42, and again in verse 44, that nevertheless, not as I will, but your will be done. Despite the uncertainty, despite the impending separation from his father, despite the anguish that Christ expected, he knew God the Father was sovereign, that he would care for him, that he could trust him. Just as God had told Joshua, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Jesus knew this. And despite his fervent prayer not to go through with all that was associated with Golgotha, he knew God the Father was sovereign and his will would be done. Thus, he moved forward. So friends, as we look towards the cross, the empty cross this weekend, during these uncertain times we are going through, whatever may be weighing on your heart, whatever may be dragging down your spirit, whatever may be troubling your mind, please know you are not alone. Christ too was troubled and sorrowful over what was before him. And know too that just as Christ prayed, you too can lay those troubles in front of God the Father. You can lay those worries before God. And most importantly, as Christ knew and was provided comfort, so too for you, please know and remember, that God is sovereign. He hears our prayers and we can rest in his will being done just as it was at the cross 2,000 years ago. Hi, Redeemer. My name is Craig Rimlinger and Mary and I have been coming to Redeemer for 15 years and we are definitely missing you guys. Um, so on behalf of my family, I would like to send you all a uh, six foot social distancing air hug to each of you. Um, so how should we view the events of Good Friday? That's what I would like to discuss today. Um, I think there are many different perspectives that people should have or that people have, but let me give you two main viewpoints. The first viewpoint is that the crucifixion of Jesus was a tragedy. It's when the religious leaders and the mob were able to successfully finally seize Jesus. And the events of that night ended up getting out of hand. And unfortunately, they murdered Jesus. Um, that good moral teacher, healer, and possibly prophet of God. That's one viewpoint. The second viewpoint is that the events of Good Friday are the sovereign plan of God who was carrying out perfectly his plan of salvation for his people. Today, I want to look at um, the book of John, chapters, uh, chapter 18, verses 1 through 10. So if you have your Bibles, please turn there with me. As we kick off this series of reflections on the cross, I would like to begin at the beginning of that night. So we're going to look at the events that took place right after the Lord's Supper. 
And the main takeaway that I want to share with you is this. Let's see Good Friday for what it truly is. This is the sovereign plan of God. This wasn't a night where something went terribly wrong, where God lost control, where Jesus finally got caught. Jesus knew exactly what was happening that night, and he wasn't controlled the entire time. So how can we know? So let's look at John chapter 18, verses 1, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So this is the third Passover that the disciples and Jesus um, had been sharing together. So Judas knew the routine, and he knows Um, where Jesus is going to be staying after the Passover. So after that dinner that Jesus shared with his disciples, they would end up leaving the Temple Mount and exiting the, um, the temple and walking down the Mount of Jerusalem. And they cross over the river Kidron and head on up to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. So verse 3, Judas then, having received the Roman cohort, which the Roman cohort is um, a Roman legion is 5,000 soldiers, and one cohort is one-tenth of that. So this is about 500 soldiers. Um, So Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, let's stop there. How did he know? Well, one reason is that Jesus is God, and I'm not going to argue with that. But I think there's another reason that he might know about this. Um, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives. They had just passed through a big ravine that's an open um, prairie, basically, between the Mount of Jerusalem and um, Gethsemane, where he's thought, where he is stationed. So it's the middle of night. Jesus would have been able to see 500 soldiers with lanterns and torches coming and approaching him this whole time. It's completely dark. If Jesus wanted to flee at that time, there's no way that anybody would have been able to catch him. He could have just head up into the Mount of Olives and disappeared. But he does not. Jesus is in complete control. So verse 4. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, he went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. Now, is Jesus in control? Or did he just fall into the hands of his enemies? Let's see. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing there with them. So when he had said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Jesus says, I am, the name of God, the name that God revealed to Moses at the burning bush. And when he says, I am, not just Judas falls, not just the religious leaders, but the entire Roman cohort of 500 soldiers fall to the ground. How about that for authority? These people can't stand in the presence of the name of God. Jesus was in complete control that night. Therefore, he again asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these go their way. Now, Jesus is dictating to the Roman soldiers the terms of his arrest. He has no intentions of allowing one of his to be lost. Again, Jesus was in complete control of that night. 
So verse 9 says, or let's back up, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these go their way. And that's to fulfill the word which was spoken of. Of those whom you have given me, I have lost none. So, Redeemer, this is the sovereign plan of God. This wasn't a night where something went terribly wrong, where God lost control. Jesus knew exactly what was happening, and he was the entire time in complete control of the events of Friday. So that would be my message to you, is realize that God was in complete control. Jesus laid down his life voluntarily. He wasn't caught by surprise. Have a good Easter. Thanks. Hello, Redeemer. My name is Joey Payro. I'm one of the elders here, and I just want to take a minute to share with you guys some, some thoughts I've had this week. Um, this week, as I've reflected on the Holy Week, uh, reading the accounts leading up to Good Friday and the Gospels, one can't help but be struck by the tremendous amount of suffering that Christ endured. I know the end of the story. I've read the Gospel accounts of the resurrection. I celebrate the great joy that was experienced just three days later. But on that Good Friday more than 2,000 years ago, it's the pain and the suffering that still strikes me. The pain that Christ endured was threefold. It was spiritual, emotional, and physical. In the Gospel accounts, it seemed that the pain just kept coming. Uh, the initial plot to kill Jesus, the realization that his disciples would fall away, the disciples falling asleep three times when all he asked was that they stay awake with him. He even says in Matthew 26:38. His soul was sorrowful even to death. We see the physical and the emotional pain that came once he was taken away. They spit in his face, mocked him, they slapped him. They released Barabbas and then scourged Jesus, an act that oftentimes was fatal in itself. They continued to mock him, stripping him and putting a scarlet robe on him. They placed a crown of thorns on his head, saying, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then they nailed him to a cross with a mocking sign over his head hung between two criminals. The wrath of God fully upon him as he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's hard to reflect on these events and think of that day as being good. My six-year-old daughter, Claire, becomes very sad, emotional any time she sees a picture or hears the story of Jesus' crucifixion or him hanging on the cross. Uh, she'll turn away or she'll bury her head in her hands. Daddy, how can this be good? Recently, Jenny read C.S. Lewis's great book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe with the Kids, and as a reward, they got to watch the movie. Um, we were curious how she would react when Aslan willingly placed himself on the altar, allowing himself to be bound, and then the knife being plunged into his heart. But this time, the tears didn't come. It was because she knew that this wasn't the end of the story that the goodness was about to come. If we look in Isaiah 53.5, we see why. He was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds that we are healed. And turn to 1 Peter 2.24, and he himself bore sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, and by his wounds you have been healed. Christ's death on the cross was the final and the complete sacrifice for our sins. There was nothing we could have ever done to erase our guilt and shame, no good deeds that, have, that could have ever overcome our sinful hearts. In the crucifixion, Christ did for us what we could never have done for ourselves. He healed us, and that is good. Redeemer, we've missed you guys. I love you guys, and I look forward to worshiping with you all uh, in this place very soon. Well, Redeemer, as I've been thinking about the cross and I've been thinking about you all, I thought about two verses in Romans chapter 8. Uh, they're some of my favorite verses, and uh, I hope they'll be a real blessing to you. In Romans 8, 31, Paul writes, What shall we say to these things? And now he, 
When he says these things, he could have all of Romans chapters 1 through 8 in mind. He could have chapters 5 through 8 in mind. Uh, he could have chapter 8 in mind. Or I think what was on the top of his mind was what he had just written in chapter 8, verses 28, 29, and 30. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. So when Paul writes, what shall we say to these things? He has those massive, incredible, wonderful, powerful truths in mind of our great God securing for us our eternal salvation. That we are justified, declared right before God, and we are glorified. Uh, that's going to happen in the future, but Paul writes about it as if it's already done. God foreknew us, predestined us, called us, justified us, and will most assuredly glorify us. And he says, what shall we say to these things? And then he asks two questions. The first is, if God is for us, who is against us? And of course, God is for us. Paul has been, if you will, spilling his guts in the book of Romans to show us how much God is for us. And all that he's done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ, forgiving us and making us his own and securing our eternal salvation. And if God is for us, who's against us? And we might say, well, lots of people are against us and lots of things are against us. They surely seem to be against Paul. But the answer is, not finally, not totally, and in the end, not successfully. Because God is for us, no one can be against us. But then he goes on in verse 32, and this is closer to Good Friday. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? This is an argument from the greater to the lesser. The greater thing is that God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. The lesser is giving us all things. It's, it's like if God can lift a million pound stone, can't he lift a 10 pound stone? And the answer is yes. How will he not also with him freely or graciously give us all things? And in context, I think all things means everything we need for life and godliness. Everything we need to be conformed to the image of his son. Everything we need to endure to the very end. God promises to give us all that we need to stay faithful to him. And the foundation of that generosity is Good Friday. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Paul looks back to the cross where God the Father gave his son over to experience the wrath of God in our place and for our sins. And he says, if God will do that for us, his children, will he not then give us all that we need today, tomorrow, and into the future? The answer is yes. And so, Redeemer, as we look back, and as we ponder, and as we praise God, and as we thank God for sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die upon the cross for our sins, as we look back, with gratefulness and thankfulness. Let's look forward with hope that this same God will give us all that we need to be faithful to him. God bless you. Mm -hmm.